Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to flip the script a little bit today. I had the privilege of sitting down with Mike Markowitz from the Lubar College of Business at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee. On today's episode, I'm not asking the tough questions. I'm in the hot seat. So if you want to know more about how to motivate employees to come back to the office, if businesses should be concerned about the policies from a compliance and legal standpoint, and if you're interested in best practices on attracting and retaining the market's top talent, then stay tuned. It was a really fun talk. Here we go. Welcome to the Lubar Executive Education Podcast. In this episode, we'll be talking about ways to engage your workforce as we move out of the pandemic. With me today is Dustin Starling. Dustin is a strategic human capital consultant whose main objective is to not only ensure his client's satisfaction, but to also work together as partners in order to find different ways for them to grow and succeed within their own business. Welcome, Dustin. It's great to be with you today. Hey, thanks, Michael. You know, it's truly an honor and a privilege to be speaking with you. Uh, you know, before we jump in, I just want to say how much I appreciate all of the great things that you're doing. Uh, I know you put out some great content, and I really hope that, uh, you know, our audience is able to take away a lot of great uh, points here. What you're doing, it's, it's engaging, it's effective, and it's very informative. So thanks so much, Mike, for this opportunity. Uh, you're welcome, and thank you, Dustin. I'm, I'm sure the audience will uh, enjoy what we're going to talk about today, and I know that they've uh, really enjoyed some of the stuff we've done in the past. So let's kind of dive right in here with uh, maybe one of the biggest topics these days from a human capital perspective, which is, should your workforce be back in the office 100% of the time, or part-time, or fully remote? What's your take on this, and what trends do you see evolving in the marketplace? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, I know a lot of businesses have been struggling with this question for really, you know, past couple of years um, as different kind of ebbs and flows with uh, the pandemic have really kind of risen up and then kind of recite a little bit. But, uh, you know, I really think it comes down to really two things, and that is really expectations and engagement. And what I mean by that is, you know, pre-pandemic, the really the expectation was you're in the office every day, right? So call it four days, five days, where that might be. Some sales reps maybe come in on Mondays and Wednesdays, I mean, where, where that might look like, but the expectation was very clear. You're in the office. And then as we started with the pandemic, you know, we really found out, which I think is really kind of neat, we could do a lot of our work from home. I'm in my basement right now, and I think that's great. Uh, but, you know, a couple of different things have kind of risen of that, whether it's productivity or that culture we're trying to build. You know, then we kind of get to now call it the endemic side, and we're, where business owners are looking to bring employees back, employees are uh, maybe want to come back, maybe not want to come back. So really, what's that look like? And getting back to those um, kind of those two different points, expectations and engagement. And I do apologize in advance. I am a huge data junkie. Um, I geek out and I nerd out about this stuff a lot. So I apologize in advance. But when it comes to like expectations pieces, you know, there was a recent um, Newsweek article and this came out you know, around the holiday season last year. And, and it said that 83% of executive CEOs wanted their employees back full time. But only about 10% of employees want to come back at the, you know, in that same kind of period, right? You know, 41% said that they would actually take a lower salary if they can come back in more of a hybrid, remote kind of, you know, working part-time. Uh, and actually Prudential kind of, um, they ran a survey in February this year. They kind of confirmed that. And they said about one third of job seekers and job switchers actually took a pay cut to get a better work-life balance. So again, I think those numbers really do work out as far as expectations where there is just really not a clear kind of finding point, whether it's coming back to the office, you know, CEOs and bosses want something, the employees maybe want something different. And then I think this is really the key piece, Mike, and that is the engagement piece. You know, the argument I, I feel like is not really over the employed versus the unemployed. It's really over the engaged versus the unengaged. And what I mean by that is again, Sorry to geek out again, but Corporate Leadership Council, uh, they ran a 50,000 uh, employee survey. And what they found is that engaged companies, they grow their profits three times faster than their competition. The highly engaged employees are 87% more likely to remain and not leave an organization. On the flip side of that, McLean and Company, they ran a study. They found that disengaged employees cost their, you know, their companies about a third of their salary. So about $3,400 per $10,000 of salary, that's what disengagement costs, you know, their employers. And that really for the national scale, about 350 to almost $650 billion of lost productivity within the market. So again, I mean, this is a very complex situation where there really needs to be that engagement, but there also needs to be that productivity and really kind of what are the expectations. And that's why it's such a challenging thing in today's market. Yeah, I like looking at this from the perspective of engagement and 
um, expectations. And speaking for myself, uh, a couple of times in my career, I've taken a different job for less pay uh, to get a little more uh, balance in my life and, and what was happening at that time. And uh, yeah, and I was more engaged because of it. And I think we've all seen people uh, who are not engaged in some of the downsides of having that in your organization. So uh, keep the data coming. Uh, it's all good. And I'm sure the <laughs> listeners are going to love it too. So, so please, uh, whatever you've got data wise, we'd love to hear. Uh, moving into this topic of engagement uh, a little bit further, you know, a lot of organizations have been trying to get their workforce to return to the office for a while now using different tactics and results have been mixed. So you've got on one end of the spectrum, uh, Elon Musk has kind of went viral and uh, created a lot of waves when he mandated his workforce return, you know, completely to the workplace. Then on the flip side, I saw an article recently with uh, Kevin Johnson, CEO of Starbucks, and he said he'd you know, go as far as to get down on his hands and knees to help people, you know, if, if that's going to help get people back to, to the office uh, or back to locations. Uh, in your view, how should this issue be approached from a leadership perspective? And uh, how do you execute that to, to get the best results? Yeah, you know, honestly, I, I, the first thing, and this sounds weird, but just slow down. You know, I think a lot of times we are so fast to, to really, here's this new policy, here's this new regulation, I need an answer today. And unfortunately, a lot of times those answers today will actually you know, we'll see the end results of the months, years down the road, um, hopefully not in the form of lawsuits, but a lot of times we just run things so fast that we just, honestly, I just say, just slow down. Uh, you know, I was actually thinking about this uh, just the other day and as it probably doesn't apply to you, Mike, but you know, maybe to me and some of your listeners, you know, you ever like woke up late for work and you're just like, you know, you're going to be late. Really? It's just how late am I going to get? You know, how much? Time? So a lot of times we, we, we run through the day so fast that, you know, we were pouring coffee. We turned the car around because we forgot our wallet and our lunch, whatever. It's just comedy of errors that happens, right? Because we are so rushed in getting into the office on time. And I think sometimes it's like that, right? Here's this new policy. Here's this new return to work, whatever it may be, that we don't actually just take time you know, use your ecosystem of support, whether it's labor lawyers or HR, I mean, all those different things, just slow down and make sure that you have the right policies in place for your workplace at that time. And, you know, again, going back to, again, nerding out here a little bit, you know, I think a lot of times we shy away from conflict and we shy away from, you know, really, I mean, as humans, we go to the path of least resistance. Well, the Josh Burson Academy ran a study earlier this year and they found that highly resilient companies have far better outcomes. Now, what does that look like? You know, about 3.6 times more likely to exceed their financial targets, 3.9 times more likely to have satisfied and retain their customer base, four and a half times more likely to outperform their competition across various metrics. And maybe the last one, going back to the previous point there, 6.7 times more likely to have an engaged workforce and retain their workforce that they currently have. So, whether it's a return to work policy, adapting new technology or whatever you're looking at for a major cultural shift, you know, just make sure that you take time to understand the policies you're, you're, you're kind of applying and how they really apply to your workforce, not just now in the short term, but long term as well. Yeah, slowing down is great advice. I can uh, speak from my own experience as well that uh, yeah. once I start making errors, I have that tendency to just they'll multiply and I've got to stop, take a moment, pause and refocus. Uh, and doing that at the organization level, I, I think is key too. And uh, you know, to your point, resilience is something that we uh, have a couple programs on and, and have done a lot of work lately, uh, more on the individual side, but from an organizational side too, resilience is huge because uh, the last couple of years have kind of shocked all of us and uh, to the core and uh, in some cases. So uh, being resilient is, is definitely gonna help you and keep everybody around you uh, you know, at their best. Absolutely. So let's say you try to decide, uh, let's say you try to get your workforce back in the office uh, with kind of a mandate type strategy, right? And what happens when your workforce doesn't come back or they partially follow that directive, which is something I'm seeing quite a bit of, right. what recourse can organizations take and should they be concerned with any legal issues? Yeah, absolutely. Again, you know, let, let's slow down a little bit, right? So, you know, it, businesses need to be very cautious about, you know, new policies that they enact. And and, I, and I'll give you 3.62 billion reasons why, you know, in 2021, there were $3.62 billion paid out in class action lawsuits. Now, now for comparison, that's a big number, but let's compare it back to the previous two years, 2020 and 2019. It was combined 2.92 billion. So in one year, 2021, largely because of what happened in 2020 and, and also what happened in 2021, I mean, 
I mean, it, it, it outpaced those two previous years. And those are lawsuits, right? These are things that are paid out by the business for a lot of different reasons. Now, the bulk of these lawsuits were in wage in our litigation. So what's that mean? Hey, I, I've had a reduction in force. I need to bring on some 1099s to kind of fill some job shortages. They're going to work 60 hours a week for a couple of weeks, for a couple of months. They're going to be misclassified because those probably should be W-2 employees, right, on a salary. So those type of things are going to happen, again, when I'm kind of rushing through, when I'm rushing through things. You know, when it comes to the other lawsuits, about $1.6 billion really kind of fell under that statutory lawsuits, and that includes unfair dismissal. Uh, that includes equal pay, any type of other discriminations, whether it's um, sex, gender, race, or whatever. So again, there's a lot of policies that have come up. Uh, and if you kind of follow stuff like I do, in 2020, 21, uh, there was actually an average of six legislative changes per day that directly affected the workforce. So the answer, you know, question is, how do I keep up with this? And the answer is, you don't. I mean, it's impossible to. So again, that's where you need to really have that counsel. You need to have that kind of legal side where you're getting that information as far as here's a new regulation, here's a new policy. How can I, number one, shield myself from this and make sure that my employees are taken care of? And then last, two, last, last thing here with that, and I feel like a lot of times employers, they don't want to put things on paper. I was working with a, about a 250 person company here in New Jersey um, and the ownership literally told me, and this is almost an exact quote, you know, we don't want anything written down because we don't want to be locked into how we treat our employees. Now, as you could probably imagine, sexual harassment, toxic leadership, all those different things was running rampant through that business. And actually, Mike, it's a lot more common than you would think. And unfortunately, that's the case. So we need to stop thinking about things like a handbook or things like policies as handcuffs. We need to think of them as really that legal shield protecting you from liability from your business. Yeah, and having some great advisors is going to help you, you know, kind of get to that mindset. And especially with a, it's a pretty staggering number, my estimation here, you got about a 20% increase uh, over a year in the, in the dollar amount of those class action lawsuits. Oh, yeah. That's, uh, that's pretty staggering, uh, in my opinion. Uh, so the big argument for continuing to work remotely is, you know, I'm getting my work done. That's what most employees are going to say. And after that, you hear, why should I take time to you know, drive all the way in the work or commute? Uh, I have to incur transportation costs. Uh, and then I'm sitting in on a Zoom meeting or a Microsoft Teams meeting all day. Uh, you also may get some variation of, well, I come all the way in and the office is empty. There's nobody else here. Uh, from the executive perspective, take the other side of it, right? The, they believe productivity increases when people get together and collaborate in person. And yeah, you know, I would concur, you can definitely get more done in person. Uh, both perspectives have that merit and are understandable. If you really want your people back in the office regularly and are looking to use more of maybe the, uh, excuse the language here, but the carrot versus the stick approach, what are some effective ways that you've seen organizations get people accustomed to kind of coming back in and person and, and, you know, rediscover the value of you know, working together in a, in a center location. Yeah, actually, you know, again, I mean, that, that's a great question. You know, going back to, you know, one thing you said, and that is really both sides have merit, right? Uh, you know, when you look at the different studies, you know, I, I may be more productive at, at home. I may be more productive at the office, you know, uh, Deloitte study back in, uh, I think it was early 2020. So right before the pandemic hit, you know, that study basically showed that 93% of employees felt that a sense of belonging drives organizational performance. So if I, if I like my people, if I like my culture, if I like my mission, whatever, that's going to drive performance, right? And you would, of course, you would expect that if I come to the office, I can collaborate better, I could more efficiently problem solve as a group, you know, so there's a lot of different things to take in here, you know, I think as far as the carrot goes, you know, I've seen some companies doing some financial incentives. Hey, you know, um, we're going to pay you to come in essentially, you know, and honestly, like, I, I'm not a big fan of that, Mike. And, and you know, the reason why is, you know, unless it's going to be kind of a carte blanche, like here's some money for gas here, we're going to pay you for mileage, whatever the case may be. My fear is that you're going to run the risk of further alienating some individuals and some employees who maybe might not be able to come in on that Wednesday or that Thursday because of reasons, right? So, you know, I, I think some of the other options that I've seen be real successful is, and the, frankly, these don't really cost money, and that is, you know, offer timely training, right? So, you know, maybe grab a subject matter expert in that field who will provide 
some office only, you know, um, kind of training, right? Whether it's developmental, whether it's kind of uh, progressing their career, I've seen that uh, kind of had some, you know, some success because that's going to bring people in. Hey, you know, we're bringing Mike in. He's going to show us the new widget 3000 XP, whatever it is. And, and he's, you know, you need to be here to have hands on, um, you know, other value added opportunities that I've seen for in office, you know, great example, if you're in sales, right, you know, bring in leads from referral partners, bring in ecosystem networking groups that can kind of come in, make introductions for you that maybe you can't do virtually. Um, maybe a little bit of one-on-one -on -one time, you know, with the higher leadership that may help you map out your career progression or, or hey, frankly, just kind of be a sounding board to hear ideas from their employees about how their department, how their location, how their business can be better. You know, those things may seem kind of like not such a big deal, but honestly, a lot of reasons why employees leave their business, a lot of times it's not about compensation. A lot of times it's just about, I don't know where I'm going to go next. I don't know the next steps, the metrics I need to hit to get promoted, to get that training that I want, that new certification. And so if you could have those one-on-one -on -one times in person as a carrot to bring people in, those are some things that frankly, just, they don't cost anything. They cost you time, but really outside of that, I, last point here is just, I think regardless of whatever the carrot is, that you do it with the buy-in of all the people, right? This can't be just a top-down kind of pushing things. Um, you need to have that like a grassroots development. Hey, you know, have those surveys. Hey, what do you want to see when you come into the office? They're going to give you some, some amazing kind of concepts and, and topics to talk about. And then you're going to have that kind of grassroots development of, hey, Hey, are, you know, Mike, are you coming in? Because I'm coming in because I can't wait to see Joe and his talk, right? Sally's going to bring some office referrals for us, whatever the case may be. So then you have that kind of grassroots support. You have that kind of middle management supervisor support. Anytime you could do that, you're going to have people wanting to come into the office versus if you don't, I'm going to put you on performance plan and then we'll talk about separation. No one, no one works good like that. Yeah, it's amazing what happens when you ask people what do they want and what, you know, what could get you to come in and collaborate with others. And you know, even myself being a little more introverted, I know us introverts are sometimes, you know, uh, labeled as, you know, we don't want to see other people. We don't like other people. I miss working with people. So it's nice to have opportunities to go and work with a client uh, nowadays that we can get back together safely or, you know, to go back to the university and collaborate and, you know, work on some new things with people and such. So finding some of those ways and, and asking people what ways uh, work best for them, I, I think is a huge, uh, a huge positive. Uh, taking a look at this from a, a slightly different perspective, uh, I want to look at it from recruiting. Uh, remote work, you know, opens up your potential talent, your talent pool to the entire globe. And if you require people to come to a set location every day, you're kind of limiting your chances uh, and your choices of, uh, you know, to a geographic area. So how should an organization weigh the benefits and disadvantages of being flexible in where work gets done and who does it? Yeah, you're absolutely right. I mean, just when you're looking at the pure talent pool, right? I mean, if I, if I have a small business here, right in New Jersey, where I live, um, you know, I'm, I'm kind of at the select from, you know, maybe within a 20, 30 minute, 45 minute hour commute, right? So that limits the pool. Now, good thing is out here in New Jersey, tri-state area. I mean, I've got a big pool to work from. Um, but if I'm especially in a call it more rural era, I mean, you can go from tens of 50 to a thousand potential hirees that can are willing to commute into your office versus potentially hundreds of thousands, right? I mean, if I have an IT business, I mean, we, we have a lot of companies that are doing work in, in Canada. We have people that are working in Singapore. I mean, across the globe that you could essentially, you know, now the great thing too is now that opens you up to really 24 seven, right? I mean, that opens you up to not just the talent pool, but the scope of now, how can I run the operations 24 seven? And a lot of times that multiplies businesses, right? So when it comes to talent pool, absolutely right. That, that really does open up um, to, to so many different things. But when you get into weighing the disadvantages and the benefits, um, you know, just a quick disclaimer, you know, depending on what study you're looking at, you know, the results can range wildly. You know, we kind of talked a bit about that already, but, you know, some things that are shown in studies will show, hey, this is a, a pro, this is a benefit, this is a con, this is a disadvantage. But, you know, let's look at some of those and we'll kind of, <laughs> kind of hash out which ones are good or bad, depending on your situation. You know, I mean, Flex Jobs 2021 did a study that found that 97% of employees want some kind of remote work. And that's, again, I think this is around March, uh, maybe May timeframe last year. And how that breaks down is they want 
58% of the employees wanted full-time remote. They, they want to be, I want to work remote always. About 39%, almost 40, want to say, I want some type of hybrid environment. So the benefits when it comes to recruiting, if you offer that type of flexibility, most likely you're going to get more applicants than if I have to come to the office. Um, and then when you start looking at the productivity and creativity, especially in those environments where I'm not manufacturing widgets, where I don't have to come into the office or the, the, the plant to do that, you know, a lot of times people find that they're more creative if I could do it in my space versus coming into the office and hearing people chat and being distracted. So I think those are some of the benefits that some people see. Um, you know, when it comes to that work-life balance, you know, again, this is again, one of those controversial things, depending on what study you look at, you know, some people find that you're, you're two to three times less likely to experience burnout. Other studies show that you're, you're about 60% more likely to work outside the normal work hours, leading to more burnout, right? So again, I mean, depending on what type of industry, depending on what type of business and the culture you have, this could be a really great thing or a bad thing to attract your, your talent. Um, and I think that's why, you know, in the recruiting process, you know, maybe make it, make it, make a statement like, Hey, look, I mean, we expect you to work. We are we don't, we don't expect you to work past the normal work hours. We don't work. We don't want you working at 11, 12 midnight. We don't want that. So nine to five, whatever it is, whatever the scope is of their work, you shut it down and that's it. And if I see you online, th there's a problem, you know? So I've seen some businesses doing that. Of course, the, the, the kind of disadvantages of that remote work, maybe there is more distractions, right? I've got three little boys running around upstairs like elephants that may be distracting, right? So maybe I want to come into the office. Um, and again, going back to that work-life balance, there might be a disadvantage or, or, or really a de, you know, detractor for current talent, it, not being able to really separate that kind of work life from their personal life. I've got 13 steps from the basement to my kitchen room. Sometimes it's hard to disconnect work from now the time I got to be dad and husband, right? So I think when it comes down to that, you really have to kind of weigh what type of employee you're looking to find, what type of talent you're looking for, and really figure out what culture works best. Yeah, it makes total sense. Thanks. So after you attract new people to your organization, they need to be onboarded, which uh, can also be another challenge if your workforce is hybrid or fully remote. And organizations have been wrestling with this for uh, quite a while since uh, COVID-19 emerged. So what best practices have you seen when it comes to onboarding people, uh, you know, over the last couple of years? Yeah, you know, I think uh, especially the last couple of years, a lot of businesses are moving to, you know, call it that cloud-based HRES, that human resources system, right? So the great thing is that has really allowed um, geographically dislocated, so remote workers to really onboard you know, I call it day zero. So that way, when I show up on Monday, I've already had my I-9, my W-4, all the personnel file stuff already filled that, right? Which makes the first week so much more painless. But honestly, what I'd say is when you're onboarding, one key thing is, again, remember that that goes back. In my mind, onboarding really starts at the job posting. And then it continues through that first interview, the second interview, the, you know, the, the demo they have to show, whatever that might be during your recruiting process. But that's really where onboarding starts. And then when they show up to the office or remote for the first day, you know, honestly, what I would say is a couple of things here. And that is, you know, boredom is really a terrible first impression, right? When I show up and all I'm doing is sitting and I'm waiting to get access to whatever that might be. I'm waiting to get my email set, you know, set up and everything else. Whatever you could do on the front end to minimize that, you need to do it because you don't want to set that first impression that you're going to be bored working here, right? And so the other thing I would say is just really grab that mentor and help them, you know, give them meaningful work, not just, hey, fill out this paper and then sit around for an hour, like give them meaningful work, even if they don't have access to whatever system it might be. It might just be, hey, come up with an idea of what you think we could do better, even though you don't know anything about us, right? Just something to give them meaningful work. And then going back to that mentor, um, C CNBC ran a survey um, earlier in the year, and that was 91% of workers said that if they have a mentor, they're more likely to be satisfied with their job, right? 57% that had a mentor said they're very satisfied, right? So just having a mentor makes such a big difference. Somebody who's been there for a little bit longer, maybe somebody who just onboarded a year ago, who's gone through the things they're going through, such a big thing. And that alone will actually reduce turnover in the first 90 days by about 40%. So again, that first impression means so much. I wish more people talked the way you do about onboarding and how it's a true experience from 
the first contact you make with somebody and with an organization and all the way through that first day, first week, uh, because yeah, it's definitely a trial period and people are, I'm sure in many cases, at least from my HR experience, you know, they're wondering on that first day, did I make a good decision on, on that first week? Is this the right job for me? Is this the right organization for me? And, you know, when they get home at the end of that first day, the first question everyone's going to ask them at home or their friends, Hey, how'd it go? What'd you think? How was it? You know, what you, what you thought it was going to be. So hopefully people want, can answer yes when they're leaving your organization for that first day and such. Yeah. Um, so now, you know, fast forward a little bit. Once you have your workers onboarded and they're up to speed on their role and fully productive, if you will, how can leaders engage them even more and minimize the chances that they take those calls from recruiters or that they start looking elsewhere for work? Absolutely. You know, and this, this maybe hurts some people's feelings, but, you know, what I would say is if you have an employee who has stayed at your business for the past couple of years through the pandemic, understand that that employee has really taken a, what I would call a loyalty tax. Right. So when I look at, you know, let's say you give, uh, you know, and you kind of highlight great, you know, two point, you know, two to four percent merit based increases, you know, you're, you're welcome. You realize that over the past couple of years, you know, job switchers, job jumpers have really seen an increase in their compensation by about 10 to 20 percent, sometimes 30 percent. So just by them staying there, you know, you need to really look at how the compensation is working, because honestly, they're getting many offers. A lot of times, you know, you get those LinkedIn in, emails all the time you know, hey, they're offering 10 to 30% more than what they're currently paying if they stayed there for those two years. So I think we can't negate that fact, right? So maybe the first thing I would say is be willing to pay a little bit more to keep your top talent there. Um, maybe use that as a way to kind of, you know, skim some people off the top as well if, if they're not performing. But again, that's something that you really need to look at if you want to retain your top talent. Uh, and really, the other thing is, you know, it's not really always about salary. You know what? I, the quote of client on my a client of mine. You know, he, he told me, and I love this quote from him. And that was, you know, what used to be viewed as fringe benefits is really now expected compensation, right? So when it came to not just the health, the dental division, you know, things like pet insurance. I mean, like we've, we've seen pet insurance kind of booming. It's crazy, right? I mean, but all those different things that used to be really kind of kept for the core executive team is really now down to the expected compensation for all employees. So look at that. But, you know, probably the last thing I would say is really, again, going back to really clearly defining how you're going to train, equip them and get them promoted internally versus leaving. You know, so when it comes to times that, you know, stop doing, I mean, don't stop doing extra interviews, do those, but maybe put a little more emphasis on the stay interviews. What's keeping them here and how can I make that better? And then that will actually lead to great. Here's how I could help this individual. Here's how I could help Dustin in his career progression, because here's what he wants to do. We're going to have that conversation. We're going to make it happen. That's going to help keep retention. And that's really going to help minimize the chances that people are going to look elsewhere. Awesome. So now that COVID-19 appears to be moving from pandemic to endemic, mm -hmm. what do you think 2023 looks like in regards to human capital challenges and opportunities? Yeah, you know, th th this is, a, and I love this because again, I mean, you know, when it comes to this is such a, um, a fun time for me personally, but, you know, I mean, attracting and retaining top talent will continue to be a struggle. Um, you know, there's more job openings than there are unemployed, right? So that's a big deal. Um, within the HR space and the human capital space, the SEC um, continues to outline their requirements for human capital reporting. Um, again, this right now is really just for, call it public companies, but it's trickling down already to the main street businesses. That's going to already, you know, that's going to overtax, um, you know, the, the current departments like HR that are already working so hard to keep up with everything. And frankly, I think with a lot of these problems that come up, a lot of challenges come up, a lot of businesses are still okay with just throwing money at it. And, and I think until we get to that part where we transition from the tactical, administrative, daily, time-consuming tasks and work, they're never really going to realize the true ROI of really investing in those strategic goals and initiatives that they really need to have. And Mike, I really feel like this is a great time for businesses to really focus on becoming resilient and more profitable. It's a truly you know, an exciting time, but if executives are willing to actually seize the opportunity, if they don't, if they won't, then it won't be. Yeah, I agree. And, you know, it's, it's been a war for talent. I know there's been a catchphrase for, for a long time uh, back to my HR days. And 
you know, it really is exciting times when you think about how do organizations attract, retain, and develop their talent. And I know to a lot of executives, it's maybe not the biggest burning issue that they have right now is, you know, retaining people or developing them further and such. Uh, I know the organizations, though, that do invest in this it, are going to come out on top in the long term, in the long run, even though it might not be their biggest problem at the moment. So uh, I agree with you 100%. Well, uh, Dustin, thank you so much for sharing your perspective and your insights and, and bringing some data uh, to all the human capital challenges that leaders and organizations are facing uh, that we've had a chance to talk about this afternoon. If any of your listeners are interested in hearing more from you, where can we point them to? You know, actually, I, I try to be as active as I can over on LinkedIn. That's probably honestly the best way to get in touch with me out there. Um, yeah, I love to connect with anybody out there. Again, I, I'm, I'm passionate about this. I love talking all things business. And really, I, my heart goes out to all the, the small business owners, all those employees out there who have really done some amazing things these past couple of years. Um, and I just really want to say thank you to all of them out there and to you as well, Mike. Uh, yeah, again, LinkedIn's probably just the best way to get me just Dustin.Starling. Pretty boring. So yeah. All right. Sounds good. I'll put your, I'll make sure we link you in the uh, show notes here. Uh, in closing, I'd like to take a moment to thank our listeners. We wish you the best of luck as you move forward on your leadership journey. And please check back with us regularly for additional episodes. Well, I hope you enjoyed my talk with Mike today. And if you want to check out more of his great content that Mike is putting out the Lou Bar Executive Education Podcast, make sure you click the link below. I hope to see you next week when I go into a little bit of a rant about the supply chain crisis and mess that it is today. But until then, check out some of these other great talks. Till then, best wishes, take care, be awesome.